you're watching Delhi Sir English, I'm Katrina Goss. We're going to bring you live images from Haiti in the aftermath of the assassination of President Jovenel Moise. After reports of a chaotic shootout in the Haitian capital late on Wednesday, the police announced that they had killed four assassins and arrested two members of the commando that assassinated President Jovenel Moise. Haiti's police chief, Leon Charles, said that the security forces were in control of the situation, even as he acknowledged that other suspected members of the hit squad remained at large. Authorities did not identify those killed or in custody and offered no evidence of their involvement in Moise's death. Immediately after the president's death was confirmed, the interim prime minister, Claude Joseph closed the Port-au-Prince airport and declared a state of siege for 15 days. Following this decision, the police and the army are authorized to prohibit any gathering that could, quote, encourage disorder in the country. In less than 48 hours, Joseph went from being on the verge of being relieved of office to concentrating his power in the country. On Monday, in an attempt to reach out to sectors of the opposition, Moise had appointed Ariel Henry, a doctor who has not yet been sworn in as prime minister. We're watching live images from Haiti. Crowds had previously gathered as there were reports that two of the suspects in the killing of the president were to be transferred. For any of our viewers just joining us, we're watching live images from Haiti after it was reported that crowds were gathering as we can see some crowds there as the suspects, two of the suspects, reported suspects in the assassination of Jovenel Moise were said to be being transferred and crowds have been gathering in the streets in the wake of this news. And as calls for foreign intervention to protect the democratic order in Haiti emerge, the Organization of American States has pledged its determination to work for what it termed the Haitian cause. As news of the assassination of the Haitian president emerged, Colombian president Ivan Duque, notorious for his administration's human rights abuses, was quick to call on the OAS to send a mission to Haiti. During an emergency meeting, OAS Secretary General Luis Almagro, who's known for his meddling in the region's internal affairs, made clear he was ready to ensure the usual interests prevail in the Caribbean nation as was the United States representative to the bloc. Final assassination, Haitians must join together to ensure peace and security and to prepare for legislative and presidential elections this year. This is the only way forward. The people of Haiti need democratically elected leaders who can take action to reestablish security, rebuild confidence in the government, and reinvigorate the economy. Our organization of American states is grieving today. At the same time, it is more determined than ever to continue working for the Haitian cause. The institutional stability of Haiti must be at the center of our concerns. And more reactions on Moise's assassination are coming in from the Caribbean region. In other news, Haiti's, in Haiti, warnings are being issued on the opportunistic use of the events in Haiti by foreign interests. Christopher Bernadel, who is a member of the Haiti Committee of the Human Rights Project, Black Alliance for Peace, has called for an anti-intervention approach on the matter. And we continue with other news. The United Nations Security Council plans to hold an emergency meeting this Thursday afternoon to discuss Haiti in the wake of President Jovenel Moise's assassination. Authorities claim the attack was launched by mercenaries posing as agents of the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration. In a statement, members unanimously called for all parties to remain calm, exercise restraint and avoid any act that could contribute to further instability. Meanwhile, Ariel Henry, the newly named Prime Minister, who had yet to be installed, also insisted he's the rightful person to lead the country in the aftermath of Moise's killing, not the interim Prime Minister, Claude Joseph.
The country currently has no functioning parliament and it's uncertain when or even if the elections slated for the fall will take place. And we have more stories coming up after this very short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. United States operatives were able to watch and hear investigative journalist Julian Assange live via streaming when he was inside the Ecuadorian embassy in London. The service was courtesy of the Spanish security firm paid for by Ecuador's government to protect the premises. The company, Undercover Global, was happy to break all codes of conduct in order to help its US friends, as its owner, a former military man named David Morales, has acknowledged before Spanish court, where he was sued by Assange. The investigation has produced witnesses, emails and documents proving that not only Assange was under surveillance, but also the diplomatic staff and the ambassador himself. The surveillance finished when Assange was betrayed by Ecuador's President Lenin Moreno and delivered to the British police after seven years. Assange is currently fighting an extradition request from Washington. And the UK High Court has notified the parties involved in Julian Assange's extradition case that the United States government's appeal will be listed for a hearing. Permission has been granted on a limited basis, allowing only narrow technical grounds to form the basis of the appeal. Crucially, the High Court did not allow the United States to appeal any of the fact factual findings concerning Assange's condition, which led a judge in January to block his extradition on fears his life would be at risk. No date has yet been set for the hearing. Assange remains behind bars in London's high-security Belmarsh prison. If the Biden administration is serious about respecting uh, the rule of law, the First Amendment, um, and of defending global press freedom, the only thing it can do is drop this case. This case is the most vicious attack on global press freedom in history. Criminalizing journalism. Just look at the indictment. They're criminalizing receiving and communicating true information to the public that no one denies was in the public interest, that evidenced war crimes, that evidenced torture, that evidenced illegal rendition. Former Brazilian President Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva would beat Jair Bolsonaro in any electoral scenario, according to opinion polls. Presidential elections are due in 2022. Survey data reveals that Lula has a preference of 43 to 45 percent of respondents against 28 to 29 percent for Bolsonaro. 67 percent of those surveyed expressed disapproval of current President Bolsonaro. Lula has been cleared by Brazil's judiciary of all charges fabricated against him by right-wing former judge Sergio Moro in the context of a wide anti-corruption case called Lava Jato. Moro falsely accused and convicted Lula for taking bribes from a large construction company and put him in jail to prevent his participation in the 2018 elections. Italian courts are reading a sentence on the so-called Plan Condor, the common repressive scheme devised by South American dictatorships in the 1970s. On Thursday, lawyers of the families of victims presented their testimonies. Appeals are also being heard from the lawyers of military defendants who were found guilty of voluntary manslaughter and sentenced the maximum penalty by the Court of Appeals in Rome in July 2019. The agreement allowed security services to coordinate information and actions resulting in the kidnapping, torture, death or disappearance of thousands of victims. With Tokyo under a new coronavirus state of emergency, the Olympic Games will now take place without spectators. The country's Prime Minister, Yoshihide Suga, announced the state of emergency on Thursday in a bid to fight an increase in COVID-19 cases. The state of emergency will begin on Monday, 11 days before the Games opening, and end on August 22nd, two days before the start of the Paralympics. This is the latest setback for the Tokyo 2020 Summer Olympics that had already been delayed for a year. Many in Japan have opposed the staging of the Games, but big advocates advertising contracts and television rights seem to have weighed more than public health.
It's a real shame that the state of emergency will be taking place at the same time as the Olympics. But to prevent the coronavirus from spreading, we must apply all possible measures. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break. Stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. Jacob Zuma, the former president of South Africa, was taken into custody to begin serving a 15-month prison sentence for contempt of court. The sentence was handed down by the Constitutional Court since Zuma refused to testify before a judicial commission investigating widespread allegations of corruption during his presidential term from 2009 to 2018. Zuma, a former combatant of the African National Congress's armed wing, Mkonto Wisisi, faces 16 charges of fraud, graft and racketeering relating to a 1999 purchase of fighter jets, patrol boats and military gear from five European arms firms. Zuma has a strong support base in his rural homestead of Nakandla in North than Kwasulu Natal. I'm happy because uh, the rule of law is what we should be guided by and I'm happy that no one lost their lives or there was no violence but him going to jail is better for the country because it shows everyone that no one is above the law and ultimately we must follow what the constitution says for all of us. You know, the law applies equally to, to me, to you, every other citizen. There cannot be a separate law for applicable to, to an ex-president. And unfortunately, he's got a lot to answer for in the state capture uh, inquiry. By conservative amounts, 49 billion rand has been looted from the country. Other states, even more. Can you imagine what the ANC government could have done with 49 billion rand? Egypt's Foreign Minister Samar Shukri urged the UN Security Council to adopt a resolution giving international clout to efforts to resolve a dispute over Ethiopia's new hydroelectric dam on the Blue Nile. Egypt and Sudan have appealed to the Security Council to intervene in the dispute and to help the countries avert a crisis. Egypt, which relies on the Nile for more than 90% of its water supplies and already faces high water stress, has a devastating impact on its booming population of 100 million. Sudan, which also depends on the Nile for water, has played a key role in bringing the two sides together. Filling the dam without an agreement could bring the standoff to a critical juncture. Both Egypt and Ethiopia have hinted at military steps to protect their interests, and experts fear a breakdown in talks could lead to open conflict. Uh, all of the three countries uh, should uh, commit themselves to not taking any unilateral actions. Unfortunately, the Ethiopians have uh, informed this officially that they have undergone and the second uh, unilateral filling of the reservoir, uh, which is uh, a violation of their commitment under the 2015 declarations of principles that uh, deemed it necessary before the filling of the reservoir that an agreement is reached. Uh, but in any case, we believe that uh, any further actions should be uh, restricted until the uh, conclusion of an agreement. A container ship anchored in Dubai caught fire, causing an explosion that sent tremors across the commercial hub of the United Arab Emirates. The blast unleashed a shockwave through the city, shaking buildings and windows in neighborhoods as far as 25 kilometers away from the port. Early Thursday, the Dubai government issued a statement saying that emergency services had brought the blaze under control. The extent of damage caused to the port and surrounding cargo was not immediately clear. The port is not only a critical global cargo hub, but a lifeline for Dubai and surrounding Emirates, it is serving as the point of entry for the essential imports. Three rockets were fired at the United States Embassy in Iraq this Thursday. Bases hosting U.S. forces have been attacked with rockets and drones the day before. According to the Iraqi army, the embassy itself was not hit, but three nearby places in Baghdad's heavily fortified Green Zone were. U.S. forces, who have more than 2,000 troops deployed in Iraq, have been targeted almost 50 times this year. But the last few days have seen an increase in the frequency of strikes. In the previous incident, 14 rockets were fired at an airbase hosting U.S. troops in the western province of Amber, causing minor injuries to two personnel.
And continuing in a takeover of Afghanistan, Taliban fighters pushed their way into a provincial capital in the northwest region, freeing prisoners and threatening to overrun the city itself. The assault on Kala Inar is the latest in the Taliban's recent offensive, which began as United States and North Atlantic Treaty Organization troops began withdrawing from the country. In a span of just over two months, the Taliban have managed to seize more than 150 of Afghanistan's 400 districts. These recent Taliban victories have put the Afghan government in an increasingly difficult position, with more than 1,000 Afghan troops fleeing into neighboring Tajikistan last week to escape the Taliban advance. And we've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at talisaenglish.net. You can also follow us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. Plus, you can catch up on our shows on our YouTube channel. For Talisa English, I'm Katrina Goss. Thank you for watching.